Hello listeners and welcome to the Montel Weekly Podcast. Bring energy matters in an informal setting. As is now tradition for the Montel Weekly Podcast, in the first episode of the year, we speak to Tobias Federico, owner and managing director of Berlin-based analysis firm and consultancy Energy Brainpool. Tobias has decades of experience covering energy wholesale markets and always provides us with valuable insights and analysis. A warm welcome to you, Tobias. Thank you, Richard. It's always a pleasure at the beginning of the year to talk to you. I think before we look forward into, you know, maybe get the crystal ball out for 2023, Tobias, and we're certainly at a very different place in January 2023 to where we were in January 2022, I'd like to take a look back. Now, what took you most by surprise in 2022? Well, that's... (laughs) That's a question difficult to answer, honestly, because um, on on one side, I was not expecting the sheer effect of a potential war in Europe. That, of course, was a surprise. But after that, looking at the energy side, I was really surprised at what speed the German government was able to react on that. Um, although we have been blind the years before, or didn't, or have we had a weed spocked? I think that's the, the better phrase to that. Um, the reaction was quite good, and it was really quite quick. Um, of course, uh, looking back, you could say we should have reacted much faster, but I think the reaction speed of the German government was really good in total. And so, in terms of the speed at sourcing alternative gas supplies in particular, is that what you mean there, Tobias? Well, not not only because, of course, looking for new gas sources takes a little time. And even today, we are not there where we should be. But especially looking into the time period when Gazprom Germania should have been sold to an unknown Russian person and was likely facing bankruptcy after that, this would have been created a huge chaos within the German energy trading side, especially on the gas side. Um, on that weekend, the German government took over Gazprom Germania, and from there, uh, they really started to look into how does energy trading work, um, how many or how often are we changing the ownership of a gas supply contract until end delivery, and when they realized that this whole supply chain is crucial at certain points, looking into Gazprom Germania, but also looking into Uniper. Um, then they reacted really quickly. Mm, mm. And do you think there's any way back for for Gazprom now, um, uh, back into the market? No, definitely. No. Not. Okay. Um, of course, we have we have discussions um, within Germany. As soon as the price is really low, then we will start again to have a delivery out of Russia from Russian gas. I think it depends on uh, the governmental structure within Russia. Um, if there is an area after Putin and it will not be the so-called Falcons, the Russian Falcons leading uh, the Russian government, um, but it will, will much more be democratic forces, then I think there will be a way back to Russian gas supply to Europe over the onshore pipelines through Ukraine. Um, but uh, I think it takes a while and I, I hope that we will uh, learn our our lessons from diversification and not have more than 20% of gas import volumes to Europe out of Russia. Mm. Absolutely. I think we talked a little bit about geopolitics uh, at this time last year, uh, Tobias. Did the Russian tactics take you by surprise, both in terms of the aggressiveness of the invasion, but also what happened on the energy side with, with gas? Well, it was one of those scenarios where we were thinking, okay, you could use gas as a weapon. You could try to weaken an economy by not delivering energy. Um, But in the end, it was a surprise that they really did it. Um, I I just said before, we have been, we had a weak spot or we have been blind on one eye. Um, Me too. I think I have been blind on that Russian eye. I was talking about diversification and risk management and risk mitigation. Um, always. And then after that, I was showing my slide regarding the dependency on Russian natural gas. And I was not really thinking the next step. And that was a surprise. So that um, they they really thought the next step and they were really doing it. Um, and I think we all within Germany or Europe, I, but I think especially Germany, um, we thought that if the economy works well, if we are doing trade with a neighboring country, this will bring peace. 
but that's only one side of the coin. But we didn't really see what ha was happening on the other side of the coin. I think, you know, it's very easy to look back and say things could have been done differently uh, with the benefit of hindsight. But um, in terms of obviously the gas supply is one side. Is there anything else the German government could have done differently? Looking into diversification, we, we had we had meetings, especially after um, the um, annexation of the Crimean Peninsula, that uh, the U.S. government, especially under the Trump administration, I think this was the biggest mistake because it was under the Trump administration, that they have been thinking about avoiding dependency on fracking gas out of the U.S. And in that period, um, the, the argument was that the U.S. government only wants to sell their U.S. gas to us, Europe, and we don't want that because we do have Russian gas. Um, so this, this is a thing looking back where I said, okay, we should have done this in a, in a different way. But in the end, looking a little bit more on the broader perspective, the German economy especially was always relying on cheap energy costs, which was in the beginning, of course, um, hydropower, uh, speaking about the last century, uh, and then it was coal and natural, um, uh, it was coal and lignite, and then after that, it was Russian natural gas. So taking this view and saying, okay, what ha could have been a good alternative to reliable, cheap energy sources. I think there was no big alternative to that. All the rest was mostly more expensive, although we should have done it looking into diversification. And of course, the uh, energy turnaround with renewable energies, um, this will also lead in the end to quite cheap new energy sources, but the, the capital investment is quite high, um, although the megawatt hour itself is quite cheap. But um, really looking bad, I, I think there were, were a few small things where I said we should have done this better. But honestly, I think it was really difficult in that time seeing everything. Mm. I mean, Germany is Europe's economic powerhouse, uh, you know, and German industry is at the center of that. And it, it's quite reliant or has been reliant on cheap energy, if you say, you know, gas mainly. Um, has that shifted now? Is that, is that at an end? Well, we are still, we still need cheap energy. Um, and especially in the year 2022 and also in the year 2023, maybe also 2024, we cannot speak about cheap energy compared um, to the years before, looking in the price of the megawatt hour. But looking into the total costs itself, because the, 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 the spontaneous shift from, let's say, cheap energy to more costly energy, what we've seen last year, leads to inflation. This leads to unemployment. This leads to much more additional costs, which are not strongly connected to, to the energy prices. So having a, a higher energy price level, which will be two or three times higher than Russian pipeline gas in the future, um, will, of course, hurt the German economy compared to the years before. But compared to the global competitiveness, I think we are quite OK. Of course, in the US, with really cheap natural gas and fracking gas, it will be a little bit tougher. But I think we have to really rethink our global economical structure, also looking at what's happening in China right now, and the global dependency on trade routes and uh, production abroad, and then you have complications there. So I think we have to rethink the econ economical structure, especially under the globalization. On one hand, you know, the German government, you could argue, contributed to the price crisis of, of certainly when prices went through the roof in August last year, because it in effect, it issued a blank check to uh, Trading Hub Europe to, to buy or replenish the gas stops, stocks. Um, what, what, what's your view here? Um, what were the lessons learned here, do you think, um, Tobias? I think the lessons learned somehow is that um, there's no free lunch. Um, of course, now afterwards we can blame, and of course it was a blank check for Trading Hub Europe to, to buy natural gas, and the market knew it, and the market took their advantages out of that. Um, that's why we have seen very high gas prices of 320 euro. We have seen 1,000 euro of uh, electricity prices in the year ahead contract. And we saw huge inflation. But what was the alternative? The alternative would have been not doing anything. And in this situation, we might have faced a gas supply crisis this winter, depending, of course, on the winter. Um, but looking into the alternatives, I think this was the only way. Limiting uh, bids to trading gas Europe, uh, trading happy Europe, sorry, to, to purchase gas 
is something where I say, uh, well, it doesn't make sense to fill up the, the gas storage because uh, filling up gas storage under economic conditions didn't make sense this year and wouldn't make sense in the next two years. So what would you do if you were in charge of Trading Hub Europe, uh, Tobias? Well, <laughs> um, I, well I, I would think that I'll have a much higher goal than just procuring gas. I think I'm, I'm doing something for the whole European economy by purchasing gas. Of course, I need market bids to purchase gas, which is a, a un, unlimited money pot to, to buy natural gas. And um, my target is not earning money or losing less money. My target is really to have the, um, to reduce the volume risk of, of natural gas. And that's something, if I would be in charge of Trading Hub Euro, I would like to continue that the next years, um, or especially this year. Um, of course, depending on the winter. And if the German government would say, no, no, we are not doing it anymore because due to that we have increased inflation, um, I would argue, no, but this is the best way. And I think the argumentation from the German government was right that, okay, we have a downside, which is high gas prices, but we have the security of gas supply. Mm. And the alternative is much worse then. Um, yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, but looking ahead now, I mean, we've been fairly lucky in that, the winter so far, touch wood, um, uh, it's been a mild winter. Um, but what what's the outlook for you know for replenishing any gas that needs to be refilled um, in the summer this year uh, and ahead of winter twenty three twenty four? To be honest, well, it still depends on this winter. Of course, we have been very lucky, and of course, we have to see what's January, February doing, especially February and maybe March. But the most likely outcome is that we will have a very good gas. Filling situation in April, that's the period usually where we start to refill the, the, the gas storage. And my, my gut number, it's not a fundamental number, it's much more a feeling. If we are, have more than 40% gas filling storage in April, we will manage to deal with the next winter. Even though Russia is not supplying any gas anymore, but with the additional floating LNG terminals and with the increase of LNG gas imports, we are able to refill our um, gas storage for the next winter, maybe as, at the same amount as we have seen it in, in, in last October. Of course, this has also a price. So we will have increasing gas prices, but not as high as we've saw it in the last year, because for the last year, we, we were thinking about filling up two winters. And then it depends on the next winter, um, how good we were going to manage that winter, because in 2024, we will have enough floating or onshore LNG terminals you will have enough alternative gas supply that this won't be an issue. And of course, market participants are also looking for alternatives um, of using gas. So we will also have a gas consumption reduction. I think currently it was 15% in total in Germany. If you take into amount the weather, it's 10% in total, which is, is quite okay. But is there a danger here, Tobias, that, that Germany locks itself into um, you know, fossil fuel future uh, beyond what it originally planned to do with, you know, with floating or onshore LNG terminals with a return to, to coal plants that are, you know, you know, firing at, at, you know, full output at the moment. Um, every coal plant that can potentially run is running. Um, but, you know, is, is there a danger here that Germany locks itself into, you know, several years uh, tying itself to fossil, fossil fuels more than, 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 uh, than is necessary? Well, officially not. Mm -hmm. <laughs> officially, we are still stuck to our phase-out plans. But um, also rethinking a few of our uh, Montel conferences we had a few years ago regarding supply crunches. I think this is, thinking is still there that we need to have the shift and natural gas is the um, energy source for bridging that shift from today's situation to completely renewable. But um, we have understood that we need to have a reliable energy source. But we also see that the reliability is not depending on the type of fuel, but also on the origin of the fuel, which means or, or, of which country is it coming or out of which country is it coming. Um, of course, um, it seems to be a, a lock-in, but... Um, Thinking about the, the, all the investments we are doing, these are stranded investments. We are doing them right now to avoid a bigger potential downside. Um, but looking into the future, that's gone, of course. Then we have invested billions of euros in LNG terminals we don't need anymore. 
But on the other hand, we are learning quite a lot about the future uh, market structure looking into hydrogen, for example, because most of the hydrogen needs to be imported from global uh, producers and the imports won't be via pipelines, they will be via, via ships. So all the handling of the shipping itself, all the handling of the global LNG slash hydrogen market, it's something we are going to learn right now. Mm. So you think these could be just switched to hydrogen, green hydrogen potentially? Um, is it that easy? And is- well, it's, it's not that easy. Of course, officially, they can easily switch to green hydrogen. And um, it's still an investment needed. And it's still, it's not clear with green hydrogen. Um, are we completely substituting natural gas with green hydrogen? Um, can we do that? No, we can't. That's quite clear. Um, and... What's about the last mile? So, um, of course, we can import green hydrogen. We can fire green hydrogen in CCGT power plants or also in gas turbines. That's, that's not um, an issue. Um, but delivering that to the heat consumption we are having, which is now covered by burning natural gas, mostly in households and also in, in small businesses, um, converting that into hydrogen is not that easy. Maybe... It's, and it's not clear the strategy right now, but maybe we, we need to convert hydro, green hydrogen into um, artificial methane, and um, then we can burn that in the households without changing burners within households. But that's a strategy um, which is not really thought through, and it's a strategy for the next decade, not for this decade. And what's the economics of that as well? You're an economist uh, by trade, uh, Tobias. I mean, and how costly is that going to be? <laughs> well, <laughs> everything which is a transition does cost more than the current situation because the current situation mostly seems to be a short-term optimum. It is, and it will cost more. Um, but even LNG, which is a transition from pipeline gas to LNG gas, will cost more and uh, two to three times higher. And compared to that, um, of course, how will be the economics of scale of hydrogen production it will cost more in the short term, but the long term cost of climate change, I think, in, in total are much higher um, than the, the, the short term additional costs we're going to have uh, if we have a green hydrogen economy. I, I think, you know, if we're talking about costs, you know, the we've had the energy crisis, the energy price crisis in 2022 and certainly the latter part of 21 as well. This has spurred a flurry of market interventions from across Europe. You know, in some ways, very understandably, because governments, um, both national governments and at the European level, want to protect or shield consumers from these high prices. Um, but what does this mean for for the future of the current market, the current wholesale market that we see in Europe? Is it is it under threat, or will do we see substantial changes to the way, um, for example, where gas and electricity are, are traded uh, wholesale? Well. Um- we, in Germany, we have a phrase which says the cow is not from the frozen lake, um, which means uh, it, it could still draw. For me, the potential interventions into wholesale markets from the political side was a much bigger threat to the whole market than the Russian invasion to Ukraine, um, just looking into the market design. Because um, I still have the fear that most of the politicians don't understand how the market are designed themselves. And that, uh, for example, the marriage order, um, on one side, it's only a description of the market and not the market design itself. It's just a model. And the mar- marriage order has four sides, and we are mostly just looking on the executed supply side. But we still have three other quadrants within the marriage order model, which are also necessary for the whole market which mostly market participants or mostly politicians especially don't see. For them, um, the most expensive power plant is setting the prices on all markets, which is wrong. Um, It's not setting the prices on all markets. It's a model to describe the day ahead market. And of course, all those markets are connected. But you could also phrase, you know, that's wrong because it's not the most expensive power plants which is setting the price. It's the cheapest power plant of the non-producing power plants starting to cover the last kilowatt hour of electricity demand. Um, So even that phrase shows you that it has two sides and in total it has four sides. Um, And that's something where I was really afraid of. In the end, of course, we are cutting um, over profits and um, 
or I think they're called random profits because there's a difference in Germany <laughs> between random profits and over profits. Mm. And um, so th we are cutting random profits, which is also not a good signal because all the years we have done everything to financially support renewable energies. And right now we have with these high prices, um, which have been caused also by uh, the uh, procurement strategy to uh, buy natural gas for our gas storage. Um, and these high electricity prices will lead to a return on investment for renewable energies within, I don't know, if you have a project within two years with, with solar panels within Germany, uh, because the cash flow out of your uh, power plants uh, of renewable plants is so high that you can refinance easily those power plants, but this has been cut with the uh, price cap. And that's something which, it's a mixed signal we are seeing right now. And that's that's a little bit, well, I'm, I'm afraid that it's still, the, the cow's not from the ice. <laughs> um, so we still have a situation here, mm. but it wasn't as severe as I thought it would be in, in summer um, when the European Commission started to look into the market design itself. But even the German government, um, they looked into this price cap um, part of, of the wholesale electricity market. And this has implication on trading, especially on long-term trading, also in the PPA market. Um, it has an effect, but it, luckily it's only temporarily. Mm. So it's only until April 2024 where we will have price caps within Germany unless the situation will still continue like that. So I think in total it was the biggest threat I saw within the market. And, and are you relieved? Or are you still concerned? No, no, I'm not really. No. <laughs> I, I, well, actually, we have spotted the cow uh, and we see <laughs> that the lake is still frozen. Um, uh, somehow we have to get the cow out of the ice before summer comes. Um, <laughs> but I'm not relieved. No, no. I mean, uh, so they're, they're clearly targeting, you know, profits or revenues. And are you already seeing, you know, a slowdown in investment? I mean, what does this mean, for example, for, for PPA markets? Um, you know, Germany is a massive uh, potential market for uh, for PPAs, power purchase agreements, which companies want to use to to, to to source green energy. I mean, is this now uh, at a standstill or is it taking a bit of a break? Well, I think it took, it, it depends on what stage the project is. For those projects which are almost there where they need the PPA for, for, for financing, this was a full stop there um, because nobody's doing a five-year or 10-year, 15-year PPA, especially looking into um, the, the next high-year prices where you have this price cap. Um, it doesn't really make sense because the project has been planned under different circumstances. Um, looking into the uh, PPA market of the shorter term PPAs, I think that there's a slowdown, but not a full stop. But looking into PPAs for bankability uh, to finance the total project, which has a runtime of 10 to 15 years, um, they will be stopped within the next two years, which means that also these type of projects won't be on the market in the next two years until this stop is valid. And so the, the price cap is, is valid. Um, so therefore, I think we see a slowdown. It was quite significant on uh, the already developed uh, projects without PPAs. Um, but uh, I think it will restart within two years. Mm, okay. That reassures some of the investors out there for sure. But um, Tobias, we talked last year also about the capacity market in Germany. Do you think, do you see this as kind of inevitable uh, given the current market situation? Not, not, not really. Um, I think, interestingly, the capacity market was in the discussion when we either were facing uh, missing money problems um, on the peaking power plants or we... Um, have been facing a capacity crunch somehow where we thought, and in, in the end, it's also a missing money problem that investors won't come to the market to invest into, into power plants itself. Um, I think generally the current market design is still an unanswered question mark at high prices where you usually refinance your investment, especially in the case that the government will intervene and cut the, the surplus profits. Um, so that's still open, but currently within the market, I don't see any discussions regarding capacity market. I think the discussion 
when they start, they start a little bit bigger, um, looking into the total market design and also sometimes into does it really make sense to have electrical infrastructure being liberalized? So the whole question, the big question. Um, but it was only a few discussions we had um, within the market, not, not not a big discussion regarding that. I mean, the bigger topic is, of course, the, the market design um, and generally what's happening at the at the EU level for, for the coming years. Um, and uh, there's still many, many open questions there. I mean, I think uh, when we discussed last year the capacity market, obviously we there's a high price scenario. Things things are, are very different. But uh, uh, you know, we could talk for for hours, Tobias, as we often do. But I think um, uh, I'd like to sort of final, you know, come to a final question. And we're hearing talk within some parts of the German government about extending the nuclear power plants uh, again. So you know, post April uh, this year, do you see that as, as likely? Well. Um, I was laughing because I was hearing yesterday with my kids a Greek myth, and it was the box of Pandora and the story of that. And um, that was my phrase in the last year when we started the discussion regarding um, the extension of the nuclear power plant um, running times, which for me is, is Pandora's box we are opening. Um, they are officially running until April, but even on the... Or, on the on the political side, we are seeing right now a lot of discussions. Yeah, but maybe we need them a little bit more because they have less CO2 emissions. So let's continue that a little bit further. It doesn't really make sense from my opinion um, because um, we still have a problem with the uh, fuel supply um, because uh, it's Russia which is exporting those, those type of... of uh, uh, nuclear burning uh, tubes, I think is officially the English name for that. And um, so still a dependency on Russia, first. And secondly, the price effect is quite low. And we are only speaking about three nuclear power plants. Um, and as long as they are running, the political discussion is open and will restart. And we will lose a lot of discussing energy um, looking into this nuclear discussion instead of using this energy in a positive way and speaking about energy efficiency, for example, speaking about a heat turnaround, speaking about a better market design, for example, um, instead of uh, speaking about nuclear energy. So because for, for most of, uh, of the, for the bigger part of the population in Germany, that's gone somehow. And also within Europe, um, we see, especially in France, a huge dependency on uh, one nuclear technology. And uh, there you have also collateral risk in cases. But that's another discussion. Um, but uh, still, I think it's, it's still an issue. It will be a political discussion. If I would bet, I would say they are going to extend it a little bit further. Um, but uh, I think it's, it's not good. Thank you again, Tobias, for, for joining the Monta Weekly Podcast uh, in our traditional first episode of the year. Thank you, Tobias. It's always a pleasure, Richard. I'm looking forward to next year. So listeners, you can now follow the podcast on our own Twitter account, aptly named the Montel Weekly Podcast. Please direct message any suggestions, questions, or, you know, let us know if you, if you think you have a good idea for a guest on the show. You can also send us an email to podcast at montelnews.com. Lastly, remember to keep up to date with all that's happening in energy markets on Montel News. You can subscribe on Apple Podcasts and Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts from. Thank you and goodbye.